Cullen, welcome back to the Hedge Eye Investing Summit, where we want to, to end with Anchorman with Kyle Bass on one of the most important topics, obviously, to anybody who's invested in global macro markets or anybody who cares about the world for that matter, uh, which is what is actually going on in China. So thanks, thanks, Kyle. Thanks for making the time. Always enjoy having a conversation with you. Of course. Yeah, just uh, we just spent some time together in Texas, Kyle and I um, had one of our sit downs. And, and I just want everyone to just be aware of the process by which I come to my own conclusions. Obviously, uh, a lot of, of what I think and know is born out of that. Um, but also, and then, and then we can texturize that with where Kyle's coming from. So again, we only care really about measuring and mapping the cycle. I'm going to give you five quick slides on that and then dive into it with Kyle. Because the real question here is whether the cycle slowing is a secular and long-term problem. So if you look at our, our current slide deck, our macro slide deck, you'd start with slide 29, which is really the fake news that has been China. Uh, it, it wasn't a fake stimulus, it was actually stimulus, but the question is, can they comp the comps or comp the stimulus, which was, by the way, if you didn't know, now you're gonna know, the biggest stimulus in the history of China fiscally and monetarily. That equated to 50% of, of, of Chinese GDP growth, just to round off the numbers, and a massive push uh, to global growth that ended abruptly in Q1 of 2019. So three more quick slides on that. You can see what's happened since, and our call was China slowing in Q1 of 2018. Um, so we did get the timing right. But again, you can see on slide 33, obviously their reserves have collapsed. Uh, the dollar being up at the 20 year high has obviously been a problem because they're funding a lot of their issues in US dollar denominated debt. Next slide, you can see uh, what's happened to China which Kyle's the first person to call out, which is, uh, and, and I, I might add way early, uh, which was right on the screws right, which is China's come from a current account surplus to a developing current account deficit, hence why they have to fund uh, their deficit in dollars. And then on the right side, also Kyle's probably done the most work on, which is where um, the non-financial uh, non sector credit is, is percentage of GDP, which makes Japan and the U.S. for that matter look like we don't even know what we're doing yet, if that's what you're into. Uh, second to last slide, you could see uh, on slide 35, you know, what is it equated to? A lot of people who thought that if they stimulated, like, a, like people who think like Americans think, because uh, if only because CNBC tries to teach you that every day, you, you buy stocks when the, when the Fed stimulates. I mean, the, the Chinese have stimulated six times, uh, or cut their, their triple R rate six times, uh, obviously since they started to slow, and it's equated to nothing but more and more and more slowing of that chart on the right, which is, we're showing you the shadow financing year over year uh, and, and, and lending. Uh, last chart, which is slide 59. Uh, this is the thing, Kyle, that I wanted to hand off to you. Um, you and I have gone through this quite a bit, which is you know, secondary industries in China you know, are the leading indicator. That's what they stimulate, heavy construction, partly empty cities, uh, all of that. Uh, and if you, if you, actually, the next slide, slide 60. And, and what's happened, and that happened on Friday, Kyle. I mean, you know, you know this number, but I just want to make sure everybody else knows the number. I mean, this has slowed to 14% year-over-year growth, secondary industries, to 68 to 5 in one month. And you know, I, I, that even surprised me that the Chinese were willing to report that bad of a number. Um, and it just you know, begs the question, which is, has this line been trying to slow to zero multiple times, really, for the third time in 20 years? And do we have a secular problem that's just staring you um, and readily apparent uh, on, on the screen on numbers that they actually t tell us, which, which you would acknowledge are, are made up numbers in and of themselves? Yeah, no, I mean, you, make, you make a bunch of great points there, Keith. And I think it's important to focus on the fact that when in China's ascendancy, call it post-2001, post-WTO ascension, they were growing much faster than anyone else in the world, right? And what they were doing is they were, they were taking growth from their other ASEAN neighbors, right? They were competing for growth uh, with their own workforce uh, and their own uh, burgeoning uh, technology industry. Uh, and what you're seeing now is the law of large numbers catching up to China, where uh, they're going to end up going from, from eight to seven to six to five, all the way down to two or three. We think they're growing at, uh, if you look at the actual numbers, we think they're growing uh, at about 2%. Uh, two and a half percent last year and, and maybe somewhere between zero and two this year. And I think it's important to note that China won't be able to grow faster than the rest of the world now that things uh, on the labor side have equalized. And that has a lot to do with their current account. And, and you showed that other chart uh, of China's dollar shortage, which we focused on. Um, when, you, when we think about China, we think about it in two different ways. One is uh, domestically, and domestically they control the printing press. They control the price level, the police, the narrative. And how many times, Keith, have you been sitting with someone and they say, but it's China. They can kind of do whatever they want to do. Yeah. 
And I say that's true domestically to a certain extent. Uh, but the real issue here is, uh, and this is Hong Kong, but I want to I want to keep going on China for a second. Um, the real issue is in China, um, you've got the situation where they on cross border currency settlement. Uh, if you look at BIS data, that it only represents nine tenths of one percent of all global trade and cross border trade settlement, and they purport to be fifteen percent of global GDP. So China's problem is they still have to interact with the rest of the world. And as they interact with the rest of the world, they have to buy crude oil. They're short crude. They're short energy. They're short food. They're short basic materials, right? They're short many things that they actually have to buy uh, to keep their GDP growing internally. So if they're showing GDP growth internally, they still have to continue to purchase things with their dollar balances or their FX balances. And so, Keith, the way that they've been plugging that hole for the last couple of years is coercing people like MSCI and uh, the Bloomberg uh, Barclays Global Ag Index uh, to shovel dollars to China because their current account's gone flat and, and we think secularly going to be negative uh, from now on. So China's real problem is, is now the rubber's meeting the road. You say is secular meeting cyclical and the answer would be we would still have cyclical uh, impulses in China if we didn't have this secular problem. And the secular right. problem is they're running out of dollars. Yeah. And as soon as the w world figures that out and the U.S. intelligence and, and uh, presidential cabinet figures out that they're running out of dollars, they realize that in these negotiations, the U.S. holds all the cards. Well, in that, uh, in, in that regard, that's, I mean, that's the next step. There's multiple uh, different uh, you know, paths we can take off that, that platform for the discussion. And we will do Hong Kong in full. Uh, but on that point, like, do you think that the, the Fed or the president or both understand the gravity of this dollar illiquidity problem and that we truly do hold the cards and, and, and that we can control the situation overtly if we, if, if we would prefer to? Uh, and I guess the second part of the question on that is, why would they? Because um, obviously if they were to step on it the, the wrong way, they'd step on a lot of things in the stock market the wrong way too. Yeah, so it's a good, good, good point. So our president behind the scenes is very focused. He's intensely focused on the stock market, if you can't tell. Um, his people <laughs> behind the scenes tell me that he doesn't want to do anything that could potentially jeopardize the stock market. And so the answer to your question is, uh, even if he may understand that he holds all the cards and the U.S. holds all the cards, I'm pretty sure that what Trump's looking for pretty much at all times is, quote, a deal. And uh, <laughs> That deal may not be synonymous with, say, the long-term betterment of our of our nation. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, Mnuchin's probably looking to uh, finance his next movie by the Chinese when he's out of the Treasury Secretary position. And so, uh, Mnuchin's kind of co-opted by uh, one one might say uh, the the evil power. So, if you're asking if they're going to go ahead and throw that switch, uh, I don't think they will. But I do think that there are many other agencies within the U.S. Uh, that can do things administratively uh, and even legislatively, like you saw in the, in the Hong Kong uh, Democracy and, and uh, Freedom, Freedom uh, uh, and Democracy Act, which passed with uh, a verbal vote in the House, i.e. an overwhelming supermajority. Uh, and when it gets to the Senate, I think you'll see a potential veto-proof majority there, uh, supermajority there. Uh, which will make it much tougher for the president to uh, execute his own agenda without, uh, without uh, that of Congress's opinion. And so you're going to see things happen from here, Keith, that are outside of the president's control. Yep. And uh, those are things that are going to be really important to pay attention to. Yeah, uh, the legislative piece, I think that's an important uh, point as a catalyst related to Hong Kong that, that you can't ignore, and it's certainly new. Uh, Derek Scissors, who you know was with us uh, last week, uh, who's from the American Enterprise Institute, uh, the Chinese scholar on that front who's quite vocal in, in terms of, he's also his, he's his, you know, it's an ungodly task. He, he Kyle, every day has to kind of basically, you know, measure and map what the next deal is going to be, which has got to be brutal. Uh, but Scissors' point was, Look, the best you can expect is, and I wanted to get your opinion on this, I hadn't asked you yet, um, but he said the best you can get is some kind of a, 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 of a deal on eliminating the 12-15 or December 15 tariffs. You're not going to roll back any tariffs. Trump loves tariffs. That's not going to happen. You're not going to get any technology transfer, no, nothing in writing on that. 
And you're certainly not going to get any of the things that you talk about, which is any, any change to human rights violations or anything like that. Um, do you think that that 1215 date, if it were true, uh, if, we were to roll, if we were not to implement those tariffs, that that would change the secular path of Chinese growth slowing? I mean, look, uh, I don't. I just think that that, uh, that, that, will, that will help the trajectory not get worse. Right. But I, I don't think, I don't think uh, pushing back that potential tariff date is going to make anything incrementally better. It's just going to slow down things getting worse, uh, or let's say not accelerate things uh, worsening. But I, it's important to note that even in the even in the uh, what they call the skinny deal uh, that was just announced, uh, that they're still working on papering because I know these three issues are so hard to paper and must take weeks. <laughs> but the third issue uh, was uh, you know Huawei being able to sell. Uh, what they deem to be, uh, you know, uh, call it non-vital or non-intelligence uh, uh, problematic assets uh, in the U.S. And I don't think we're going to get there as a country. I don't think we're going to get Huawei in. And I think what you're going to see out of the Justice Department in the next um, few months is you're going to see the Justice Department, you know, tariffs are a, are a sledgehammer, right? Uh, they're a very blunt force instrument that Trump likes to use. But uh, you're going to see DOJ start using the FCPA, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and they'll use that like a scalpel, and they'll start cutting companies uh, out of the U.S. that are uh, uh, endemically uh, corrupt. And uh, you could, and, and a lot of these, a lot of the, a lot of the corruption that exists in many of these companies is actually already documented in court cases around the world. Right. Call it Central, Central and North Africa, uh, uh, the, the the Middle East, and and, and Asia. Uh, all you have to do is go pull court cases, and uh, our U.S. attorneys can just cut some of these companies out. And again, that isn't up to President Trump. Yeah, well, that, I mean, that, that, and I know you have a lot of respect for him, uh, Brigadier General Spaulding's book, recent book, Stealth War. I mean, it it, it kind of blows your mind that these things have been happening, and they are documented. I mean, if you haven't studied them in sequence or watched the time series like I have a central tendency to do, it's like, oh, my God, this has actually already happened, and everybody knows it. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say everybody already knows it. I think, you know, even when you go, you know, I spent a week uh, in D.C. meeting with people that focus on uh, China and issues like this. And when I brought up the fact that Chinese companies that list in the U.S. don't actually have to adhere to the same standards as U.S. companies listed in the U.S., yeah. they don't have to submit themselves to covered audits or become Dodd-Frank compliant to raise money in the U.S., I, Many of the congressmen and senators looked at me like I had three eyeballs on my forehead. <laughs> they, they, actually, they actually didn't know. And so there are many things out there that people just aren't aware of. Yeah. And uh, uh, they've been suppressed or, or the press hasn't carried it for whatever reason. And, you know, the press has run with this issue of, oh, the president's deciding whether or not to, to stop capital flows to China. This isn't up to the president. This is up to our legal system, right? And our and our Securities and Exchange Commission, and maybe even our Department of Labor, and we can get into that. But there are, there are administrative changes that can be made, and then there are legislative changes that can be made that are completely outside of the president's uh, uh, wheelhouse that can, that can actually stop these capital flows. And, and Keith, I think you're also going to see, I know, I know this sounds crazy, but maybe we should require foreign companies to adhere to the same standards as U.S. companies when they raise money in the U.S. Wouldn't that be, you know, just a, just a bright light, you know, like that they actually have to comply? Uh, this, this stuff, I mean, and, and I, I meant everybody uh, euphemistically, right? So you're, you end up in a place, though, where, and, and this, I think this is a major problem with Wall Street. Like, they're going to paint Kyle Bass as this guy on China, or they're going to, Paint me with whatever they want to paint with me t t today. Um, but generally, yeah. what, what you're doing here, and what I certainly aspire to do, is creating a level of awareness. Like, it, let's start with yeah. the educational process on what's already happened. So uh, I want to do that on Hong Kong next, because I think you've done you know, some great work on that. You've obviously got some slides ready for that. But I, I, just a general level of awareness. Like, it's kind of like, like, let's say that you and I don't nail every single move of every single day of every single thing in every single market. We're still going to provide somebody with an education like so that more yeah. and more people are aware. I mean, awareness is where risk management yeah. starts. So maybe uh, maybe I, if you I, want to I, kick I think, off on, on Hong Kong. Yeah, let me make one comment on that, then we'll go into Hong Kong. I think we all we all look at the incentive structures of, of all the players in every, uh, in every game that we look at. And you saw it in the NBA. Their incentive structure was money over morals, right? Or money uh, over, over freedom of speech. And I think 
uh, the incentive structure, you mentioned Wall Street, the incentive structure of Wall Street is to embrace China, is to hope that more M&A happens, that more IPOs happen because they just see fees. They want 8% of this, they want 10% of that, they want 5% of the next deal. And Wall Street would love for that wheel to keep turning. And so they are incentivized to oppose CFIUS reform. They're incentivized to love China, not hate China, because China dangles that golden carrot out in front of any Wall Streeter that uh, wants, to, wants to chase it. And so the incentive structure has been uh, put in front of the various constituencies, and that's why it's difficult to hear the truth um, about what you and I are talking about today. And so uh, the good news is, is it feels to me like that tide started changing about uh, six months ago, maybe a little yeah. further. Well, I mean, and, when, uh, I think, when it I, think was, I think it, it will continue to change. So well, let, let's talk about let's let's talk about Hong Kong. Well, that's I mean, because that's what changed it. I mean, I'd say it's certainly one of the big parts of it. When people start, it's staring them in the face, and it's on television. It's not just a Wall Street friend of theirs that's asking the questions. I mean, people are taking water cannons to the head at, at a bare minimum. Much worse has happened, obviously. Um, but this is yeah. you know, this has gotten people to feel you know, Americans actually probably feel guilty if they're um, if they made a lot of money on this and that they didn't really you know, put up their hand. It's, it's explicit. We know this. Um, so again, yeah. we're not, we have a lot of clients on this call, by the way, that are private equity clients, institutional money managers. Obviously they're not, I mean, if, if they want to fire me for hosting this call, then so be it. I'll live another day. But the reality is that we're still going to make them aware of different points of view and certainly make them aware of the data um, that you have here, right here in Hong Kong in particular. Well, I'll, I'll make, I'll make one more, I'll, I'll issue one warning before we get into Hong Kong. For those, of, for those clients that are institutional fiduciaries, and more importantly, ERISA managers, if they're a private uh, pension fund manager, all right, they, they're held to a higher standard of uh, fiduciary, uh, their fiduciary capacity. And uh, if you read, it's a DOL, uh, it's a DOL rule, right? Uh, the DOL set up the ERISA Act of 1974. And in that act, it, it stipulates that they need to run their uh, fiduciary role uh, as a, quote, prudent man. And uh, the prudent man rule uh, stipulates that they need to ha uh, execute higher levels of diligence and consideration for the, invest for the investments of the pension fund. Well, I have one question for you, Keith. Do you think the definition of prudence should equal investing in a country that, that has no rule of law, that doesn't submit themselves to covered audits, that isn't Dodd-Frank compliant? I don't know how uh, investing money in global indices and or directly into China A shares or H shares that don't submit to audits, I don't see how you could be deemed to be prudent. And therefore, your legal liability is a lot larger than you think it is. And I think you're going to start to see plaintiff's firms come after you. And mm -hmm. so I'll warn you that that's coming. Well, it's a good thing I'm not uh, running so money. Let's get into Hong Kong. <laughs> okay, let's do it. All right. Um, so uh, so you guys have, as uh, Kyle slides, uh, the Hong Kong economic shift to goods and services. Maybe we start with that. Sure. Uh, so I, I, the point I try to make here is, is, a, is, a, is a simple one. And uh, basically, Hong Kong, as we all know, used to be uh, the largest port in the world uh, by 20 foot equivalent unit throughputs or, or container throughputs. And uh, they used to be a massive net goods exporter and re-exporter for southern China uh, and, and themselves. And what you see here is, is in the red, red bars are goods. Uh, the blue bars are services. And uh, what happened, I think, to the, to the untrained eye, you'd look at this and say, well, it looks like the global financial crisis uh, turned Hong Kong's economy upside down. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's just coincidental that, as you know, China ascended the WTO in 2001. Uh, and in that ascension, what happened was they spent an enormous amount of capex uh, on their southern port infrastructure. So Hong Kong used to be 23% of the largest of the 10 largest ports in the world throughput, through, throughput. 15 years later, they're 6%. China used to be 9% and now they're 61%. Hmm. So what happened is while China or Hong Kong used to be the southern port for China, now Hong Kong's just another city in China. And so they flipped and now they're a services based exporter uh, and a massive net goods importer. And when you think about these things, they face China on all their services and they uh, import goods from the rest of the world because Hong Kong uh, uh, is now 
net short goods. And, and why, why is that relevant? So when you go to the next slide, Hong Kong's relative importance from a financial perspective, Hong Kong used to be a quarter of China's GDP in the early 90s. And now it's back down to about two and a half percent. Strategically, it's really important from the perspective of geopolitics. Um, financially, it's important from another angle. And of course, we all know that's because this is where China raises all of its dollars. The majority of its dollars uh, is through Hong Kong. Uh, but their, their GDP as a percentage of China's GDP has, has waned. So slide, the next slide shows you that uh, what's gone on in Hong Kong, when you look at private sector credit to GDP, Hong Kong's the most levered nation in the world. And Keith, when we talk about the macro and, and taking five or 10 steps back to understand what just happened, you think about this, Hong Kong's been pegged to the US dollar and therefore has imported US monetary policy for 36 years. And that import requires them to basically uh, let Jesus take the wheel and let, and more importantly, meaning Greenspan and Bernanke and Powell, uh, they take the wheel and they dictate Hong Kong's monetary policy to, to, a, uh, to, a, sim to a significant extent. And so what happened going in the financial crisis is we dropped our rates from 5% to zero. Hong Kong came along with us. Uh, at the same time, Hong Kong's largest trading partner, China, hit the gas pedal. And so what we've seen uh, so far is we've seen Hong Kong's real estate market explode. Imagine money became free right while their largest trading partner started growing double digits. <laughs> so from 2008 to 2018, it was the best 10 year period Hong Kong will ever see in its entire existence. It will never happen again. And so what's happening now, going back to slide five, is what happens when money goes, goes free? Well, you notice on this chart, there was a slope that was fairly linear and then it kind of went parabolic. Well, it went parabolic in 2008 when money became free. Mm -hmm. But private sector credit to GDP of 300 percent. And you guys know how levered the U.S. and Japan are in the private sector. They're both around 150. So Hong Kong's leverage. Hong Kong is the most levered developed nation in the world. You look at page six. Hong Kong's banking sector is now 850 percent of GDP uh, in assets. And Keith, you remember back when uh, Europe had their had their issues uh, back in 2011 from the from the their own financial crisis. You had Iceland, Ireland, Cyprus. They all fell like dominoes because their banking sectors got to be eight, nine, ten times GDP. So if you lose three to five percent of your assets, it literally bankrupts your entire sovereign. Right. And so what's happening in Hong Kong now is you've got enormous amounts of leverage and you've got enormous amounts of banking assets. And uh, now you've got a problem on page seven with uh, interest rates with first liquidity. This is a busy chart. It's a scatter, scatter diagram of, of what, what we deem to be their excess reserves. They call it their aggregate balance. So the way the, way the peg works is for every 7.85 Hong Kong dollars that are in the system, there's a dollar in their system. And they claim, and the people that are the architects of this peg claim that, that it's an impenetrable peg, i.e., the peg's perfect. And um, I'm going to point to a few things that'll tell you why that, that, that isn't true. But the point we're trying to make here is outside of the actual dollars they had in their system, they also have their rainy day fund, which is what we call their, their aggregate balance. And that's, that's this chart that we're looking at here. And what we're seeing over time is now the aggregate balance is, uh, has declined from call it 270 billion HKD to 55 billion HKD. Uh, and we're in the convex portion of the rates curve. So once they run out of excess reserves, they're going to have, they're actually going to have a liquidity issue and they're going to have to raise rates to, to maintain their currency. The problem is in Hong Kong, as those of you that, that live there or that, that bank there and know this, is 95% of the loans in Hong Kong are indexed to one month high bore and they reset monthly. And so you can't, raise rates like they raised rates in 97, 98 to keep the peg because you'll detonate an over levered uh, banking system. So I'll, I'll make a couple more points and then that, uh, Keith will get to some questions uh, if you want to ask some questions. But page eight is, is a really important page. So uh, last month, uh, what we saw is we saw a $16 billion decline in the, in the reserve balance of Hong Kong. And what that means is money just left the system. And people say, but that's okay 
because when you extinguish an asset, you extinguish a liability, the system's fine, it's not gonna break. And this gets into the, the May 20th letter that we wrote, Keith, uh, that we're happy to, to share with you if you haven't seen it. But in there, we talk about the Fed. And we say, the Fed, the US Fed got to 4.7 trillion on its balance sheet. Uh, and they, their goal, their stated public goal, was to get that Fed balance sheet down to two and a half trillion. We wrote May 20th that it's our view you can't get it below three and a half trillion just due to Basel III requirements and the amount of liquidity and repo leverage in the system. And what we saw recently is we saw Fed funds spike and we saw liquidity problems in the US that the Fed had to immediately respond with. And, you know, uh, people at the Fed, especially Williams, who, who said that this was a, a pipe dream and it was crazy, all of a sudden realized that he was dead wrong. And he was dead wrong about uh, the amount of liquidity in the system, the amount of, uh, of usable reserves, the amount of, uh, of collateral in the system. The same is going to hold true for Hong Kong. If, if, if money leaves and they have to extinguish assets and liabilities and let's say contract M2, you can't contract M2 when your banking system is 900% of GDP and private sector credits 300% of GDP. So that's a really important point to make for those people that think um, all is going to be well. If, if currency pegs worked, if currency boards worked, it's actually technically what they have is a currency board, um, then Argentina would still have uh, the peso one to one to the dollar, right? Argentina's peso was one to one to the dollar and they had, quote, a perfect currency board, just like Hong Kong going into 2001. <laughs> and now where's the Argentinian peso, Keith? Yeah. I think it's uh, 58 or something like that, right? It's, they've, they've lost all their, all their power uh, mm -hmm. over time now. Again, the political situations are different. However, let's go to slide nine. So typically this time of year is when uh, Hong Kong has an enormous tourism influx. Well, as you see here, tourist arrivals from China are down 40% in September. Um, all arrivals are down over 21% and the all arrivals number is lagging. And so uh, we're hearing that the, uh, that the October numbers uh, are worsening. And so uh, you've got a problem when you go from a high growth, highly levered country into a country of contraction, contraction in the money supply, contraction in revenues, contraction in trust in the, in the government. I mean, these things don't hold together when the leverage is as large as it is. So if you're invested in Hong Kong, I suggest you pay a lot of attention to this and decide whether or not you want to be around when, when things really hit the fan. Mm -hmm. I think the answer to that is, uh, generally speaking, not many if they're aware of the situation. The president of our firm, Michael Bloom, who helped me with the discussion with Spalding, he, uh, he was just in Hong Kong and it wasn't to, to go on a tour, it was to, to, to close his bank accounts. And I think that that's, um, maybe you get a little bump on the tourist uh, numbers just for that. <laughs> people, right. but, but quite seriously, I mean, people that understand the situation have taken this seriously. And I guess ultimately the question is if you have, which is a broadening recession, this is not a debate on, uh, economic terms. These numbers are, you know, their rate of change numbers are going to be published weekly, monthly. Whenever I get the numbers, I'll reiterate it on Hedge ITV and the Macro Show every morning. Uh, those, that's not a debate anymore. The, the question is how deep and interconnected of a recession slash depression do they have in Hong Kong? And that's really, I guess, the question I have for you on that, because, you know, uh, it's one thing to not have a run, run on the bank uh, in Beijing, but it's an entirely a different one in Hong Kong, is it not? Yeah, I mean, uh when you think about the, the construct of the banking system in Hong Kong, uh, the two two of the largest banks in Hong Kong are uh, are bankruptcy remote subsidiaries of, of British depository institutions and Standard Charter and HSBC. Right. Uh, right. And uh, I can tell you this: if you understand the way the UK law works, um, it's not going to be UK taxpayers bailing out bankruptcy remote subsidiaries in Hong Kong when the shit hits the fan. Uh, then you've got Bank of China Hong Kong, which does all of the RMB. Uh, settlement. And Keith, one thing we've noticed in deposit rates, um, the Chinese banks in Hong Kong and the Hong Kong banks have been offering uh, two to four month deposit rates of six and seven yeah. percent when when one year high bores at one percent. Yeah. Right. So they're really struggling for deposits and they're having to raise rates massively for for what they call new money uh, just to try to attract new money in. And you, you remember going into the subprime crisis, what happened to the banks here? The worst offenders 
that were charging the hot that were sorry giving out or, or awarding the highest depository rates for the were the worst offenders and that that just uh, when you saw Fremont savings and loan and and uh, Whamu and the others paying higher and higher deposit rates to try to attract capital uh, that was the precursor for the failure yep I mean it always is and, 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 and I guess the one thing I guess that is insulated China itself you know China properly as opposed to, to just like you said Hong Kong um, is that they have that closed capital account so they have not had your your emerging market uh, current account deficit driven currency down in a ball of flames uh, you, set up but you essentially you're oh. you're you're saying that okay maybe well, actually, I don't know. I think you, you, you wouldn't say that that's never going to happen in Chinese yuan terms. But here in Hong Kong, you're saying the probability is that it happens sooner. Yeah, the only reason it hasn't happened in China, if you look at the numbers, is they, they've been able to come through Reg S exemptions. They've been able to come to U.S. markets. They borrowed a, Chinese corporates have borrowed a trillion USD. <laughs> if you look at the BIS numbers, it's like 1.1 trillion. And they borrowed it all in the last four years. And now they've got MSCI uh, and the and the Bloomberg Barclays Global Ag Index funneling them, you know, 80 billion here, 100 billion there. The, again, U.S. forced investment through passive flows is what's keeping it's the only thing keeping their capital account uh, at the break even level. Yep. So to your point, if those flows titrate, slow down or are stopped altogether, uh, China is going to have a real problem with their dollar shortage. A massive problem. This is, an, and I think it's a big thing that people get wrong on Wall Street. Again, there's DC people, there's Wall Street, and then there's everything else. I mean, there's a lot of divide in terms of people's awareness on on all these numbers, time series, where we came from, where we could be going. Um, by the way, if you have questions, uh, thanks for submitting them in the queue, Kyle. I'll, I'll start to fire some off. Um, uh, actually, right away, because some of them are, are obviously going to be better than mine. Um, and, and one question, you know, it's a follow-on to what I was going to ask anyway. How, how will China respond, if at all, to a break in the Hong Kong dollar peg? And how do you see this playing out, Kyle? I mean, my, my view is that, uh, you know, if, if China has the best economic and financial system like they say they have, which, of course, we don't believe them, right? All the integrities in the U.S. system. Uh, and we've been at this a lot longer than they have. <laughs> but if they do have it, then why is Xi's little colony still pegged to the dollar anyway? Uh, if, if, if you look at currency pegs throughout history, uh, the, the currency that is pegged to call it the parent uh, or the host, uh, their economies have to have, they have, to have a, a fair amount of synchronicity, i.e. when they grow, they grow together. When they uh, contract, they contract together. And that's, that, that allows the peg to work. So I think the peg will go from a dollar-based peg to an RMB or an Asian basket uh, of, peg, uh, of currencies. And I think it, it will happen in one day, right? China will use its RMB exchange rate to buy the dollar reserves of Hong Kong. And in the time it takes that trade to settle, which is one day, they'll be pegged to the RMB. And I think that'll happen at some point in time. Hmm. It's certainly been a differentiated view. And, and, and look, and, and, and this is the way risk works. It, it, it happens slowly, then it happens all at once. All the different things that cause it are measurable. You can map them, uh, like I said, weekly, monthly, as you get more incoming data, more market information. It's fascinating to watch how Asia trades, as you know, every day relative to the U.S. FOMO. I mean, people are just hoping and praying, literally praying, that Trump tweets something yeah. that gets a deal done. But the reality is it's been the cycle all along that's caused market disconnects. And, and again, look, look, since we've got the bean deal or whatever the heck that thing was a, a couple weeks ago, you know, the, in Shenzhen stocks are down two and a half percent, you know, and, and um, in Shanghai, they're down almost two over that same time period that are people are just, you know, batshit crazy chasing uh, the 50 day moving average in the S&P 500. Yeah, I mean, look, any Cracker Jack president can get the Chinese to buy some food. They're short food. Yeah. Lots. Right. Uh, and so that's not that big of a deal. Uh, but I, I think when you get into the substance of any of those issues, I don't think there's a deal to be had. Uh, the real issue, uh, truthfully, Keith, is, is President Trump and which side of the bed he gets up on that day and, and whether he wants to, quote, yep. have a deal. I was sitting in a meeting uh, with one of his advisors who said, you realize uh, if, if Trump just does a deal and just gives in, the, the Dow will go up 5,000 points and uh, Trump will get reelected. And he smiled like, that's a great idea. And, you know, I looked over at him and I said, at the expense of hollowing out our country, I think that's crazy. Yeah, uh, but I'm just telling you, the, on the advisor side, that's what's being piped in. 
Yeah, I mean, and it's it, it, it's it's the uh, same thing. Actually, Scissors said he he said, look. The reality is what it is. Trump will decide on that day what he's going to do and why. Uh, but he also reminded me that Trump loves tariffs. Trump loves America. Trump like Trump doesn't love Xi. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of there are a lot of different issues, and he certainly uh, doesn't love death camps or you know these. You know, actually, that's one question I have before I take questions about what you've already said. What is it about that? And does this find its way back into the new U.S. legislation on Hong Kong? Um, you know, the human rights side of the, of the equation, the Uyghurs and the numbers that you've, um, you've outlined, I think you've, you've really stirred the pot in saying, you know, this three million number on death camps. I mean, A, is that, is that true? And, and B, is that something that your average American might just say, wow, that is completely screwed up? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I urge everyone that's listening to, to look at China tri, uh, Chinatribunal.com. It's uh, the UK uh, just held a tribunal. The person that oversaw it, uh, it was the same QC, uh, uh, Queen's Counselor in the UK, that oversaw Slobodan Milosevic's war crimes tribunal in The Hague. So this is a bona fide uh, hundreds of interviewees tribunal where the UK determined that they are uh, live organ harvesting. They're organ harvesting at a live people in China from prisoners of conscience, i.e. Uh, uh, religiously or ethnically persecuted uh, people. And, you know, I was sitting with someone on the Senate Intelligence Committee who said something to me that was just kind of off the cuff, and I'm not going to tell you who it was, uh, but they said, you know, we knew this was going to be bad when we saw the crematoriums being built at the, at the concentration camps. Ugh. And uh, he said, you know, the smoke, they're not choosing a new pope every day there with the white smoke. It's, this is horrible what's happening there. And I think we all turn a blind eye to that, uh, either A, hoping it's not true, uh, or B, uh, we don't want to think about the ramifications of a disengagement uh, with China. But for some reason, we keep uh, engaging them. And I think it's uh, profits over, over uh, morals. But I think we're going to start to, uh, in, in, you know, enforce Magnitsky sanctions against uh, uh, the worst perpetrators there. Look, Keith, I'll, I'll give you a couple of anecdotes. The province of Xinjiang actually came to the U.S. markets and borrowed $200 million from U.S. markets so that they could build out the concentration camps. Then they went to the World Bank, and on the World Bank's balance sheet today is a $100 million loan to the government of Xinjiang. They needed some more money for construction materials. That's disgusting, man. That, that is... That it's is... unbelievable. Ugh. I mean, I'd, it all has it all. You know, people say to me, well, what would happen if we disengage with China? You know, U.S. GDP would drop one and a half to two percent immediately. And I said, I just don't care. They steal almost two percent of GDP from us today every year. And they actually earn a positive return on their theft. Mm -hmm. So I think it'll be a wash over time if we just disengage. Will will our T-shirts and sneakers cost more? Yeah. But somewhere in Vietnam or Cambodia or Malaysia, they'll make it. It'll just cost a little bit more. Yeah. And you said, you know, that it's people over, uh, you know, profits over people. I, I think it's, it's profits uh, over awareness. Like, you know, th th this, aware like you said, in the last six months, something has clearly changed. I see it in every institutional meeting that I have. I was in Chicago yesterday. I was with you in Texas a couple weeks before that. It's, it's, it is now part of the debate. In fact, it is central to the debate. And it's, you know, people right. haven't had to worry about that. So it's like anything else. If you turn a blind eye, to what is obvious, you can only do that for so long before everybody else sees it as being obvious. So I, I think that it, I, I would bet, I mean, it'd be betting against the spirit of, of, of America to bet that, that we just sign off on that in, at the expense of profits. I, I would not bet, I would not have that trade on if I could, if you paid me. I agree. And I think that, uh, look, I, I chaired the risk committee of, of, of UT's endowment uh, for the last uh, three or four years. And had been on that board nine years and just termed off in, in uh, September. But the University of Texas Investment Management Company had its first open board meeting debate about the pros and cons of China last month. Wow. First one. So it's on. And so it's, it's just starting to happen. It should, have, it should have happened long ago, but it's just starting to happen. And I think when you see some... When you see suits brought against ERISA managers for breaching their fiduciary duty to their investors, when you see the, the DOJ start to use the FCPA to carve Chinese companies out of the U.S., 
I think that awareness level will 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 go up uh, exponentially. It, 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 it is in motion. Like I said, it, at first it happens slowly, then all at once. Uh, on this on this question, there are a bunch on fiduciaries, and keep them coming. Thank you for the questions. Um, speaking of fiduciaries, Kyle, please comment on what would happen when it comes to the time to make withdrawals of corporate profits or pension money from China, and these fiduciaries find out that they can't. Yeah, that's a great. It's a that is a great question. I'm of the opinion that given that that tenuous balance of dollars in dollars out of China, you know, there there are still I, you probably know this uh, when when China first started opening up to institutional community, they, you could invest uh, directly in an asset manager like in uh, a commingled fund, but you could also set up a Q fee account, which which was basically an approved institutional account by China. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, today there's still limits on how much you can withdraw from your QFI account. So the fact that China claims to have a, a true market-based economy, A, is a joke, but B, um, I'm afraid we can't get our money out. Uh, and so when people realize they can't get their money out, um, I think that's going to cause problems with U.S. auditors here. And right now, you might be keeping uh, those assets as a level one or level two asset in China. And you might be forced to to market as a level three asset. You might have to start to discount it, uh, which will, of course, dramatically change your return profile as a fiduciary. Yeah, this fiduciary problem. Uh, I mean, man, this is a, that that's certainly recasting it within the lens of something that gets people's attention. And there are a lot of questions yeah. on that that people are. Let me, let, me give, let me give you one more anecdote on that. There's a uh, one, there's a top ten ENP multinational uh, that has. Uh, a little bit more than than a billion and a half dollars in cash in China, and uh, they've been trying to get it out of China for two years, um, and they keep getting uh, inundated, pardon the pun, with red tape, and uh, they haven't even disclosed it to their shareholders, which is something interesting to me. It's a public company, um, and for two years they can't get out a billion and a half dollars, and so it's it's interesting to me that their auditor still considers that to be cash. Yeah, that's uh, what we would call a level three asset, I think, uh, legally here in the yeah. U.S. And we know what those are yeah. now post Lehman. But nobody knew what those are either, Kyle, until uh, after Lehman. But Keith, what's interesting is they, they're not incentivized to, to tell anyone about it because then, uh, then what if China shuts them out of doing business in China because they told everyone China won't let them have their money out? Right. Uh, now, um, on that, like... Uh, uh, Anytime there's a situation like this, you have a you know what we call quad four, or actually in China's case, it's now quad three because because inflation, even on their own reported numbers, just hit, as you know, a six year high last week. Uh, so what they have is ac actually economic stagflation, which can be much more problematic for levered assets. However, you may classify those assets. So uh, when yeah. I th when I think of that, it's like well, straight up the middle, what you do is you short the most. Yeah, you know, the largest base of credit that is the least liquid, which would have a bullseye on private equity. Um, private equity, obviously, you know, not to name names like Schwartzman, but there are certainly plenty of players who have done quite well by being partnered with the Chinese. How do you think that plays politically? Is it an election issue? Is it just an issue uh, for now? You know, Schwartzman's company is obviously public. Yeah, I uh, again, not to name names. I I think that. Chinese private equity is going to be a very big problem. Uh, I don't think the private equity firms that have huge investments in China are going to be able to to harvest them. Um, uh, you know, private equity in general uh, has been a great space for all institutional fiduciaries over the last ten years. It's the best, um, and I think it'll continue to do well in the U.S. I think if you've got Chinese JV partners or you've got Chinese private equity, I think you should. Uh, just buckle up because it's not going to go well from here. Right. Um, but you do like, and you know, I know that you know, so I, I just want to put that on the table. I mean, you do sit at the table where there are major players from Wall Street, whether they be from the asset management community on the private equity side or otherwise, where there is a genuine lack of engagement on the topic. They, like, because yeah. to engage would be to admit, and that's not where we're at. That there, That is not a good place to have a discussion right now. I actually want to. I want to make a point, though. I know a lot of these. I've met a lot of these private equity uh, principals, and believe it or not, there are private equity firms that are huge private equity firms here in the U.S. that made a conscious, thoughtful decision to never engage with China. Uh, and now, while they might have taken some Chinese investors' money as LPs. There are private equity portfolios in the U.S. that are very large ones that don't have one Chinese investment. Right. And so 
I think there are some thoughtful people out there that were willing, to, again, to forego the juggernaut or this, this allure of, of great returns in the future uh, because they thought it was too problematic. There are others, as you know, that went all in and have 60% of their entire firm invested in China. And those are the ones I think are going to be in trouble. Yeah, there's a, there are a lot of a lot of different ways that that, that can go. Obviously, um, the uh, I guess I guess on the technology qu uh, topic, there are a lot of questions, Kyle. I mean, d just to boil it down, do you think there's a hope in hell that the Chinese admit that they even stole our technology? Never mind, we have a deal on it. Uh, no, I, it's antithetical to their to their mission. Keith, I'll make I'll make one interesting point about this. You know, if you whether you read the DIUX report. Uh, which is DOD's report on how much technology is stolen annually, or whether you read the trade reps report uh, to the White House, uh, the numbers bandied about in both reports, uh, which are multi-year investigations, are somewhere between 200 to 500 billion a year in uh, technology theft and, and forced transfer. Um, when num Think about a number that big. And, and uh, Keith, have you ever read an 8K that says, China stole X billion of technology from us, and we need to let you know that they stole it. It's interesting that no companies in the U.S. have ever admitted theft, <laughs> but our government's telling you that two to five hundred billion a year is getting stolen. Yes, yeah, you would never write off the idea of getting that next incremental order, would you? Would you, Kyle? I mean, you got there's this. Well, you know, the, the only the only place I've seen it is right in in lawsuits where we saw we saw. Um, Huawei stealing the, the Tappy the Robot case. I don't know if you've read that one. No, uh, I haven't. From, oh, you should read that one. That's a good one. It, they have video of the of the Chinese engineers putting putting parts in their backpacks as they walk out of the lab. And and yeah. uh, anyway, you got you got to read the lawsuit uh, and watch the videos. But that's one. And there and then in the Duke Technology case, where the the Duke PhD student end up taking uh, the the, uh, the 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 metals. Uh, the, the, the material science uh, ideology from Duke in order to build China's hypersonic weapons uh, it was just truly remarkable. Yeah. And so think about this, the NIH funds huge portions of our entire uh, uh, university budgets in the United States. Uh, I think the U.S. government should say, you know, if you're not going to put uh, real controls on your technology and the ability uh, and limit the ability of, of uh, foreign actors to steal it from you. We're just going to stop funding you. Hmm. Wow. I mean, but so we need to bring accountability to the university system. So many of these uh, subtopics that are interesting. We're going to, we only have uh, about five minutes left here, Kyle. But there's another topic here and a lot of questions on this too, because you, you, you just brought it to bear. Some people are like, so what's the catalyst to get U.S. politicians to act? You know, on, on many different levels, that's the question. I want to tie that to what I learned. I didn't know. I mean, I'm Canadian, for God's sake, so I don't know that Mitch McConnell's married or you know, who his wife was within the context of who Spalding taught me his wife was. You know, how does that, how is, <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe that's an open volley for you, but, you know, you have a, a, a significant U.S. political leader who has been able to do what he's been able to do for so long. At the same time, from what I understand, he's, he, he would be, uh, pro uh, legislation on Hong Kong. Yeah. So, uh, uh, this is a, you're throwing you're throwing me a, a lit firebomb. Uh, but <laughs> it's a Canadian I, lit firebomb. We just had an election. I'm good. I'm fine. Everything's cool. We're all nice right, again. Right. We get along with everybody. I I'm just so take it. No more no more blackface pictures of Trudeau. We're we're, we're <laughs> oh, finally we're through the gauntlet, right? Yeah. Um, but but I think uh, I I direct everyone. If you look at my Twitter feed from from yesterday. Uh, as you know, the, the emperor of Japan uh, was, was uh, in, a, in a formal ceremony yesterday, and uh, there is a video of, of McConnell's wife, Elaine Chow, uh, talking with Wang Kishan. And act actually, they're talking uh, like they're not supposed to be talking to each other, and <laughs> Wang is here. And uh, look, uh, she's got it there. Oh, you've got it pulled up there. Uh, you know, notice they're pretending not to talk to each other. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I, fi I find that to be fascinating and interesting uh, altogether. Elaine Chao, uh, well, as you know, was was in Bush's cabinet, uh, is in Trump's cabinet, and um, is definitely in McConnell's cabinets. Uh, but I think uh, back when they were dating is when is when uh, here's a fun fact: the Hong Kong Policy Act of 1992 was sponsored by none other, none other than Mitch McConnell. 
and it was when he was dating Elaine Chow. They were they married the next year, um, and so I'm not saying she's bad or good. I'm just saying she's incredibly connected over there, um, and uh, I think it's important to note that if we're going to call the Hong Kong police out for their gross human rights violations and the Hong Kong government out uh, for their lack of autonomy, I mean. Uh, if you just look up the definition of autonomy, I'm fairly certain that Hong Kong's lost all autonomy. Uh, the problem is there are 200,000 Brits in Hong Kong. There are 85,000 Americans in Hong Kong. The American Chamber of Commerce there is the biggest, biggest pro-CCP lobbyist, maybe in Washington, D.C., because all of the people that have money invested in Hong Kong don't want to lose it. Exactly. And so they want to overlook all of these violations and they want to they want to move on. But it's, it's great that you see, I mean, when was the last time you saw Rubio and Pelosi get together and launch legislation that passes with a supermajority? Yeah. So you're, you're asking when legislators are going to do something. I'm seeing things happen in Congress and in the Senate uh, that haven't happened since 9-11. I saw unanimity post 9-11, and now I'm seeing unanimity here, which is a very good thing. Because, again... These are these are difficult things to look away from once they're put in front of you. Right, and and, and it's a political opportunity. So, what do you think uh, Elizabeth Warren's going to do with that uh, relative to Trump's yeah. stance on China? I I think Elizabeth Warren's been looking to outflank Trump uh, on China, and she's done a hell of a job of it so far. But you know, the real problem is though, uh, Keith. When I was in D.C., I was meeting with some people to talk about uh, uh, Rubio's uh, Equitable Act to try to. Uh, put some things. Uh, talk talk about putting some things in the bill that were more restrictive on uh, on uh, foreign listings in the U.S. And one legislator's office that I came into, uh, I sat down and he said he smiled at me. He says, hey, "You know who's sitting right where you're sitting yesterday?" And I said, "Who?" And he said, "The head, the former head of the CSRC, the uh, professor at Stanford uh, that used to run the Chinese Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, was here telling me." why it's a bad idea to require audits on Chinese companies. Hmm. And so he was actively lobbying the U.S. Congress as a former head of the Chinese SEC to tell us why we shouldn't require their businesses to be audited because it's a national security problem. And our congressman said, well, we audit Raytheon and Boeing and all the others, and they have all top secret clearances, but the audits don't give away any top secret clearance. They just make sure the numbers are the numbers. And he didn't have any response for that. That's but ridiculous. What I'm and, I, and I think you dropped a Magnitsky bomb there, too, uh, while you were answering. Uh, we're just uh, dropping a lot of your knowledge, as you usually do. Isn't, isn't yeah. that, if I recall, isn't that the Russian legislation on, on disclosures, corporate disclosures? The, yeah. So the, Mag the Magnitsky Act is, I think, the, sh the, the number one tool that I think will be used against gross human rights violations in, in the world. What it does is enables us to unilaterally sanction uh, and prohibit travel and, and sanction at the assets of gross human rights violators around the world. Bill Browder, yep. uh, former head of Hermitage Capital, uh, what, his lawyer was Sergei Magnitsky. If you haven't had the, read the book Red Notice, Amazing I suggest book. you read it tomorrow. Uh, but Bill Browder is a human rights champion, and he is the one that has gone around the various legislatures around the world and, and brought Magnitsky sanctions to be, and now we just need to implement those sanctions on the violators. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a very interesting uh, catalyst. It looks to me that would, that would seem politically uh, bipartisan at the very core and likely. Yep. So, so that's, that's, uh, because, that's important. Because it's evidence-based. The difference yep. between tariffs and the FCPA and Magnitsky sanctions is FCPA and Magnitsky are all evidence-based. And if you have the evidence, you can go ahead and implement uh, these punishments, and, it, and it's very difficult to talk around. If you're just going to slam them in the head with a sledgehammer, it's it's an effective blunt force instrument, but I don't think it can be used extensively over time. I think you're going to have to uh, get more specific with your grievances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and maybe last question on this because we've just run out of time. But um, you know, most people, you know, when they look at risk, they want it to just be packaged almost in a maybe in a Tiffany blue box. So it all, it, it's all right there. That's all you have to worry about, Kyle. It's all just going to happen on that one time with that one catalyst, with that one domino. Clearly, that's not the way that any risks ever worked. Um, but when you think about the, the dominoes associated with at least your bear case, how does that find its way home? Like, how does it find its way? And I'm talking about markets maybe uh, primarily is where I'm thinking. Uh, how does that find its way back into U.S. economic risk, liquidity risks, et cetera? Well, 
look, if, if I'm right about if I'm right about Hong Kong, which clearly we're right, it's just what degree of right we're going to be. Um, and if we're right about China, what does that mean? Well, that means their currencies will both depreciate vis-a-vis -vis the dollar to be the the, uh, the the counterbalancing mechanism, and they'll have a restructuring. It, it's not the end of the world. That happened uh, post. That happened from 88 to 2002 in China, where they dropped the triple R to 5%, recap their banks. They'll do it again. Uh, again, the world will move on. Uh, but what does that mean in the near term? It means the U.S. is going to have to slow down. If Asia slows down you know, materially, then the U.S. will slow down and Europe will slow down. We'll have a mini recession. But with that comes a more difficult question, Keith. And it's once we get rates to zero, will we go to NERP or will we start buying stocks like Japan? You know, the central banks only know one thing, right? I mean, uh, they have a hammer and everything looks like a nail and their hammers lower rates and buy things. And so I'm I'm thinking about I, I'm not I don't think we're going to see a, a collapse in stock markets like we saw in 08. It's not going to be anything like that. I think it's going to be much more idiosyncratic. I think Asia is going to have a lot more trouble than the U.S. And I think that the capital is actually going to flow towards the U.S. And I think we have the the most robust, most uh, uh, the markets with the most integrity in the world, and I think uh, I think I, I'm not sure our stocks will go down that much. I think our rates will go to zero pretty quickly, uh, and then the question is, what happens? You mentioned we had stagflation showing in China. At some point in time, we're going to see some sort of stagflationary impulse here, but I think we're going to see a little deflation first because the world's going to slow down. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good roundup on a lot of different topics. And I know, I, I think we could have talked uh, for the entire uh, other hour if we had it, but, uh, but, but thanks for making the time. You're, you've done so much work on this. And again, I, I, like I said, it's not about like, when is this call right or whose call is what call for that matter. I just think it's a general level of awareness and, and you should be thanked for doing such great work on that and certainly for making you. yourself available to, to our audience. So thanks, Kyle. You too, Keith. I appreciate the time. All right, we'll talk to you again. Thanks. Right. He's, uh, he's Kyle Bass. You can definitely follow him on Twitter, and he doesn't, uh, he's certainly not shy when it comes to revealing what he learns next. And, and I highly suggest, in terms of awareness, that you have that on your dashboard. And uh, you can find me there, too. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate it.